Okay, year 10. This week's poem is called Rising Five by the poet Norman Nicholson. And you should have received the vocabulary list. These are for you to consider the definitions, um, and especially how they're used in the poem. So make sure you do that exercise first before diving into the poem. All right, we'll go ahead and read the poem first and um, then make some observations uh, specifically about the layout here, <clears throat> how it looks on the page. All right, but first to read the poem. Rising five. I'm rising five, he said, not four. And the little coils of hair unclicked themselves upon his head. His spectacles brim full of eyes to stare at me and the meadow reflected cones of light above his toffee buckled cheeks. He'd been alive 56 months or perhaps a week more. Not four, but rising five. Around him in the field, the cells of spring bubbled and doubled, buds unbuttoned, shoot and stem shook out the creases from their frills, and every tree was swilled with green. It was the season after blossoming, before the forming of the fruit, not May, but rising June. And in the sky, the dust dissected the tangential light, not day, but rising night. Not now, but rising soon. The new buds push the old leaves from the bough. We drop our youth behind us like a boy throwing away his toffee wrappers. We never see the flower, but only the fruit in the flower. Never the fruit, but only the rot in the fruit. We look for the marriage bed in the baby's cradle. We look for the grave in the bed. Not living, but rising dead. One thing I want you to appreciate or notice is how this poem looks on the page. Um, if you look this poem up, sometimes they won't have the lines, um, you know, scattered like they are here, uh, especially this area in this part of the poem here. Um, there, there's something about the way the poet has laid it out that I think needs to be appreciated and, and seen in this way. Um, but, you know, you get a, people that'll just put them, push these all the way to the ends. But um, there's, a, there's a dropping down and pushing, pushing the words for this line all the way to the end and then um, finishing it here. And you'll see it's done over and over with the not four, but rising five, not May, but rising June, not day, but rising night, not now, but rising soon, not living, but rising dead. Um, and this, this, I think you can argue, goes along with um, meaning that the poet is trying to create uh, there's a there's a sense in this poem about rushing ahead to the next thing, uh, ru like skipping over what's happening now and looking ahead to the next thing, and that, and I believe he's trying to mimic the meaning uh, with the placement of the the words in the line. So pushing ahead, and you know, pushing you on to look at the next line to get the rest of the phrase. And so there's some some meaning that's um, strengthened with, with that. And then we also want to appreciate how kind of scattered this is on the page. Um, it happens when this line, the dust dissected the tangential light, uh, and you, if that's an image of like, when the sun comes in, uh, you know, cuts across your line of sight, 
and all of a sudden you see all the like little, little bits of dust and floaty in the, in the air around you that was there before, but you just didn't see it because of the, the angle of the sun rays all of a sudden makes it visible to you. And I don't know if trying to go for kind of that kind of look uh, with the dust scattered in the sunlight. Um, certainly I think there's some significant meaning um, besides just uh, that image. I think that, that he's trying to also have, um, or sorry, create deeper meaning there. Um, so it would make sense to um, emphasize it visually as well. Um, but certainly it, it looks like somebody's, you know, computer or margin settings <laughs> are broken here. But um, as far as I can tell, the way it's laid out in the anthology that we have, the, this is how it's meant to look on the page. The rest of my slides, I, I can't fit it all on. And um, so I wanted to stop here at the beginning and just point out to you that um, the the poet is doing some things visually with his line break choices that you go you're gonna want to connect with meaning okay it's not just like oh I fancy uh, scattering my words around it, it connects with what he's trying to say here it's also very makes it difficult to actually tell where the stanzas are I think with all these breaks here and you'll actually, if you do a bit of reading about this poem online, you will see that some people think this is a three stanza poem and some people think it is a four stanza poem. Best I can tell, it is. this is the first stanza, this is the second stanza, and this is the third. But you will find people who will argue that there's a break and that this is, okay, uh, its own stanza. So... Best I can tell, it's a three stanza poem. All right, what is this three stanza poem about? Well, the summary of the story that you have in this poem is that we have a speaker who's in a meadow with a four-year-old, <laughs> and the four-year-old is telling the speaker that he's not four, but rather he's, quote, rising five. Um, and they're in a springtime meadow together when this when these words are spoken, apparently. The speaker contemplates this viewpoint as a metaphor for broader human perspective that tends to look to the next phase instead of enjoying the current moment. Okay? Um, it's like almost like this simple moment turns into a philosophical pondering of a human viewpoint and human tendencies that what turn what starts as a kind of a light-hearted comic um kind of like oh that's such a kid thing to say turns the poet um making some realizations about even perhaps his own viewpoint okay so um this little boy's uh comment or you know, when he's, when somebody, uh, you expect that something happened right before this poem started, like, um, he, maybe the speaker said something like, so you're four years old, or mentioned something about this little boy being four, and it, the poem starts with his response to whatever was said, either asking about his age, saying something about him being four, um, but this, kind of indignant response, like, I'm not four, I'm practically five, I'm rising five, um, is the trigger for this, for this contemplation, okay? Um, as far as a purpose, um, we, I have several to offer here. Um, one could be to explore the human tendency for dissatisfaction or restless anticipation. Like just want to hurry up and get to the next thing. We get bored or um, just, um, yeah, dissatisfied or discontent 
with where we're at and we want, always want to push to the next thing, um, explore the next thing, um, kind of not pay attention to what's going on in the now in, because we're either preoccupied or anticipating the next thing. Um, next one, to explore how human experience is cyclical like the rest of nature or how nature and human life um, are comparative. Uh, to contemplate his own viewpoint after seeing maybe like the folly in the little boy, like, oh, isn't that cute or isn't that funny that that's the way he looks at things? And then sort of a self-realization of like, oh yeah, maybe me too. Um, it could be to ponder human existence in time and the reality of death, that our lives are limited in, in, this, in uh, terms of time, and that at the end of our time is marked with death. And it's part of the heavy heaviness to this poem. Um, perhaps it's to challenge readers and and the um, poet uh, himself to live and enjoy the moment, or like live and enjoy the present that you're in. Um, and possibly another one would be to contemplate uh, mortality, the the reality that. Uh, death is is at the end of our human experience and human existence, uh, at least in a physical sense. Okay, um, he doesn't really go up beyond the physical and um, into a into a deeper spiritual um, point. It's quite um, natural and physical based. Okay. Um, if we kind of walk through the poem from beginning to end, I believe the tone starts out almost comical and at least lighthearted at first because I think some of the description of the little boy is a little bit cartoonish. And so it's almost uh, like a lighthearted, ha <laughs> you know, isn't he cute kind of thing. Um, and then um, there's a sense of the... The voice being very observant to what's going on around him as he as he switches focuses to the springtime nature that's there around them and then there's a shift to the the voice becoming more reflective and contemplative and I would say near the end quite sober and philosophical okay uh, in the third stanza that's definitely uh, true Okay, for the notes about structure and feature, kind of like big, big picture things, we've got three stanzas in this poem after some debate <laughs> uh, on my part to make sure I'm giving that to you correctly. Um, we'll call it three stanzas. Um, but these, these stanzas aren't regular in their length. You'll, you'll see that... Um, they are differing lengths, okay? I think this first one's about nine lines, and this one is hard to count. <laughs> and then uh, a little bit, sh definitely shortest here at the end, okay? Um, there is some amount of end rhyme used, but there is no consistent pattern. There's definitely little bits of rhythm here and there, but nothing consistent. So I should have put this in here, but um, maybe next to your stanzas or in one of your lines you can jot down that it, it would be considered free verse because there's nothing regular or patterned. While there's lots of, you know, poetic tools used, um, they're not patterned. Okay, so free verse would be um, and something you could add to this list. Um, I just so that you have this in writing, I have written down staggered spacing in lines with a repeated not hmm but rising hmm pattern. And we can see as we read through this that this pattern, while it's not an exact repeat, um, these 
these three words with kind of fill in the blank, um, fill in the blank for each time it's used, serves as a type of refrain. Okay, remember a refrain is something that's repeated at the end of a stanza or the end of a line or whatever. Um, it doesn't have to always be at the end, but it often is. Okay, so it serves like a refrain. Uh, and then just for kind of an outline of what the different stanzas focus on, first stanza focuses on this image of the little four-year-old and and him introducing this idea of rising five. Okay, the, the, and it's the rising five, him saying it is like this a kind of trigger for the poet to uh, make a realization, ponder, ponder something deeply, um, explore an idea. The second stanza focuses on the springtime description of nature and it ends with a with like his his attention scanning off to the um the beginnings of of sunset or you know heading toward the end of day but it's a, the image there is of the sun lowering in the sky and then lastly the third stanza focuses on life cycle in the natural world and in human existence Okay, so in the first stanza, I know this is a little bit cluttered, but um, I have a lot of notes. So um, you can either, you know, however you want to do this, annotate around your um, poem. You can highlight like I've done. Um, but these these notes that I have around here, you're going to want to either get them into your, you know, in the spaces around your poem or, um, you know, write them out in note form uh, under a stanza one heading, okay? Um, so let's uh, start off with how the first stanza creates a vivid picture of the boy. And I've included this little cartoon picture because I'm trying to capture this idea of the comically large eyes that are created by the glasses. When he says his spectacles brim full of eyes, he's kind of creating this, um, you know, how sometimes uh, the glass in glasses will magnify and it can almost make somebody's eyes look bigger than they are. And um, it that's the effect I think that it's going for with the brim full of eyes to stare like his big, huge eyes behind these spectacles. Um, and then they, besides the big, huge kind of comical cartoony eyes, uh, the poet also creates this um, picture of the coils of hair and um, the uh, cheek that it says, um, toffee buckled cheeks. <laughs> and uh, if that confuses you, it just means, um, hopefully you know what a toffee is. And he's got a this big wad of toffee stuck in, the, in his cheek, between his teeth and his cheek. And while he's talking, he's got a you know, big mouthful of toffee. And it when it says toffee buckled, it just means it's kind of distorting the shape of his face. Um, I've got that down here. Uh, <laughs> and so it's it's kind of a funny little picture of him, these big eyes and his cheek all sticking out the side because of the toffee in there. And likely that toffee in his mouth too is going to uh, affect the way he speaks as he argues indignantly about not being four, but rather rising five. Um, you also get this picture of his uh, little coils of hair. So we imagine he's got some curl to his hair uh, in this vivid picture, as well as this really specific observation about reflected cones of light. Now, all this means is that the the way the sun light is hitting the glasses is casting an interesting shadow 
on his cheek, okay? And I've got that here. Uh, th this is simply a description of how the sunlight and the gla lens of the glasses cast triangular shape on his face. Um, now, if this is meant to be symbolic, you could think around some ideas about light and the child in the light and, um, you know, if that has any meaning about, you know, him being enlightened or not enlightened. <laughs> um, but you, it's creating this really specific picture um, uh, of a striking, almost comical, but all really detailed at the same time. Um, and then what we also can pick up um, from the description is the little boy's personality, okay? And here in green and highlighted in green, I've got some ideas on that, that um, he, I've highlighted his words, I'm rising five, not four, okay? You have to imagine the way he would say it too, kind of like almost offended, at least sort of assertive, like, wait a second. Um, and then, um, he, he, he's ready he's ready to argue his point and this this image here of the little coils of hair unclicked themselves upon his head it's almost like another kind of cartoonish effect where the hair is almost like kind of raising up or like you know like like uh, cartoon characters almost like show their emotions through you know different the body language but your know, facial features expanding or contracting it's almost like his hair is standing up on on end and you now i mean i've got this idea of like hair raising up on an animal when they feel threatened um but it's almost like his his hair is just like boring or stands up on end like oh you know what are you saying to me? <laughs> um, or almost like making himself look bigger. Now, can a little boy really like unclick his his curls and make it, you know, like stand up? Um, no. <laughs> That's why um, it it's comical and humorous. Okay? It's, it's a little bit of um, hyperbole going on here for sure. But it, it's meant to make it light-hearted. Okay, that's where I, I think the light-hearted tone comes through. Um, he, f I've written down here, he feels his four years much longer than, uh, is much longer, and so 56 months um, kind of demonstrates that idea of how slowly time passes for little kids compared to what it feels like for an adult. Okay, um, imagine you've only lived four years, um, you, you, the months that you lived are more a higher percentage of your life than what a month is to you now at the age you are now. And then take, you know, your life and compare it to mine. And I've lived three, at least three times as long as you. So, um, you know, exponentially, <laughs> a month to me is not the same as it is to you. And, and, and a month to you is not, would not be the same as it feels in length to a four-year-old, okay? It's a long time between birthdays <laughs> for a little kid. Um, and so writing out he's, he'd been alive 56 months, trying to, um, to like express the sense of time that the child feels. And that's why he's, partly why he's like uh, saying, hey, I'm almost, almost five, because he's been four for a really long time. So he's pretty sure he's getting really close to five. Um, and it introduces that idea uh, right away of this longing for the next thing, longing for time to pass um, so we can get to the next phase or the next thing or the next challenge or whatever. Um, the other thing I have up here is the sound effects of little coils of hair unclicked. What we've got here is consonants. Now, consonants is when um, the same consonant sound is repeated. Uh, if it's alliteration, it means it comes at the beginning of words, but the L and the C sounds 
or the hard C K sounds are repeated in this um, phrase, little coils of hair unclicked. Now, did your hair make noise? Um, apparently this kid does. <laughs> okay, but little coils of hairs un sorry, little coils of hair unclicked. Um, there's some sound appeal and some rhythm that um, I think adds animation to this uh, what I would say comically overdrawn character uh, that he's creating this cartoonish character out of this little four-year-old um, and kind of over exaggerating his response to being called four like what I'm not four um, I'm rising five I I'm I'm way past four. I'm not like four was like so yesterday. It's like not even happening. Okay, but yet he is four. Um, and if you do the math with uh, fifty six months, you'll find out that fifty six divided by twelve is just you know just over four and a half. Okay, so <laughs> um, while he's past the five the halfway mark, um, he still has quite a ways to go um, before he. Uh, you know, hits his uh, fifth birthday. But uh, the idea here is he's anxious to be five. He's done being four. But he is, you know, in reality, he is four. Um, but his his focus, it would seem to be uh, on the anticipation of turning five. And here at the end of the stanza, we have... The phrase is not four, rising five, repeated. And that serves to emphasize uh, this concept, or this kind of catchphrase, if you will. It starts the pattern of the not hmm, but rising hmm, that is going to um, emerge out of this poem. And it, by repeating it as well, you get that the effect of it catching or capturing the speaker's attention. Like when he says it, he, he, uh, by repeating it, it's like he's grabbed onto it and he's sort of pondering it or holding in it kind of in, in his mind and turning it over. Not four, but rising five. And it's what sends him here to start pondering bigger concepts, um, beyond it and and around it so that's what we mean by when you explore an idea uh, you kind of thinking about how it affects um related topics or or the implications of it okay um let's move on on my next slide here um we're gonna shift to in the second stanza he's gonna start talking about the you know, springtime imagery that's in the meadow around them. And I am no biology teacher, um, but um, I think it's important if you aren't familiar with cycles of fruit trees um, that for just a moment, <laughs> you have a look at what um, a fruit tree coming out of winter and into, you know, through its springtime um, cycle would look like um, that first buds appear and those buds are going to become flowers. Um, this happens to be an apple tree uh, one. I'm sure some other fruit trees maybe the order is a little bit different. You know, like their blossoms come first and then their leaves. On this one you get green leaves and then the the blossoms, you know, the buds are, are there then the the tree is in full blossom and this is when the little bees and uh yeah mostly bees i guess i don't know if any there's any other um well insects that help pollinate um but the flowers are open and are pollinated hopefully because once pollinated the um petals will get will fall off the blossoms, but what remains is the start of the fruit, okay? So, I mean, in theory, for every blossom you have here, you could have a 
uh, an apple. Okay, but this is important. I'm not just you know busting into our poetry lesson with some biology, but um, or botany, I guess it would be not biology, but um, because he's talking about time of year and this process, and this process is an important metaphor or image in this poem about phases and stages and how we are you know looking when we're in the one stage we're already looking ahead to the next um you know and the idea here is like instead of enjoying the the flower stage we're already thinking about how many how many uh, fruit am i going to get out of this right um instead of just sort of enjoying the beauty of the flower stage all right and then over here i've just um lined out and you can put these in your notes the idea of uh the cycle of fruit trees because he talks specifically about trees about springtime blossoming and fruit and so i don't know what kind of fruit trees they are but we could pretend they're apples i suppose and um we would know that the bud comes first then then the leaf comes out of that budding a blossom comes out of the middle of that the blossom fades and we have the start of fruit okay um hopefully that visual uh helps you as you try to imagine this now i know this is really full but this is the longest um stanza and i'm trying to get it all in one um slide so we could uh you can copy things while I'm chatting at you about them. Okay, so I already told you that in stanza two, the, sh the focus shifts from the little boy to the, n you know, the nature scene around them in the meadow, okay? So uh, these first couple lines say, around him in the field, the cells of spring bubbled and doubled, buds unbuttoned, shoot and stem shook out the creases from their frills. And every tree was swilled with green. It was the season after blossoming, before the forming of the fruit. Not May, but rising June. All right, so we're going to stop for a minute. And in green, I've got all a bunch of the natural life references. Um, like, mostly there's a focus on the season of spring and what happens at the moment at that moment in nature and then of course the focus as I talked about in the last slide on the um, stages of a fruit tree um, so like nature related terms I've got here in green field cells spring buds shoot stem tree season green blossoming fruit shoot uh, you know we're not talking like a firearm here you know we're not shooting something a shoot and stem are part of the the growth of the tree okay part of a plant is a, sh a shoot is um, and then mixed in with these natural uh, words as you can see those are in green and then in this sort of bright pink I've highlighted words that connect with references to clothing and it makes it sound as if this, this um, personification makes it, makes it sound as if the tree is like putting on springtime attire okay like um, kind of shaking out the their springtime dress to put it on okay so we've got references to buttons shaking out the creases from their frills and then doubled like a a doublet is a is a kind of an old-fashioned um clothes word but uh it gives this image you know the natural and then the sort of i don't know sophisticated but um nature putting on uh the a uh, springtime clothes and um there there's the idea of beauty here um there's the idea of um okay sorry the uh, idea of beauty of the idea of value um and almost like maybe even um kind of like a posh uh, dressing up here um, 
and the emphasis on the the beauty and value of the season okay um we've got a lot of really cool um sound effects going on here in these two and hopefully you can see what i've done here i didn't do it on the lines because it's so small but what i've tried to do up here is i've got the line bubbled sorry bubbled and doubled buds unbuttoned and there is a ton of b's and d's and a couple t's but they have a really similar effect when you say it bubbled and doubled buds unbuttoned okay it's blah, 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 blah. it sounds like uh, uh, something bubbling and boiling and percolating okay and so you have several devices going on here consonants the repeated sounds of the bds and t's you also have some internal rhyme going on with bubbled and doubled um and what happens because of those things is it creates a sense of rhythm and that rhythm um really cr helps create this idea of the energy of this lively scene okay that the spring is shaking out its um sp you know best dress <laughs> to put on for this spring and and so much is coming alive and um you know there's ener the energy of springtime when everything kind of wakes up from its winter um dormant season uh, there's a lot of energy going on and the sounds of these lines help create and mimic some of that energy you also have the sound effects of the next line where it says shoot and stem shook out the creases we've got some consonants with the repeated s's and t's um and the k's and K's and C's, so the sh, st, k, uh, there's a lot of re similar repeated, and, and you've got the same thing going on here, you've got some sound effects of, of the image that is being created, like if you take up some, something that's made of fabric and you're taking it out of a box and airing it out to wear again, um, like you did last year, or you're doing the laundry and you give give the fabric a shake, you get some of the same sounds that is being created by the repetition of the sounds in this phrase. So again, it's consonants, it's um, internal half rhyme because um, shoot and shook um, is not quite a rhyme, but it, I would call it a half rhyme, um, but also the onomatopoeia of shook. <clears throat> uh helps create the the fabric being shaken out or rustling of the movement sounds and that adds to the energy too okay so um all of this is is helping us feel the lively energy of springtime and this connects um i think with the idea of kind of the, a traditional way of viewing um, the seasons of the year as symbolic to stages of human life. And springtime would always be connected in, in a comparison like that with childhood. Um, and things are, you know, life is fresh and new um, and there's a lot of, you know, brand new energy and that would go right along with this this little boy and the stage that he's in um being in the springtime of his life um connects really nicely with this season that is in the setting in this meadow that they're in um but we see that it quickly moves from this um, beautiful, beautiful scene of springtime, nature in springtime, um, quickly moves to not May, but rising June. Um, oh, I, I, I missed out this, uh, word in blue, swilled. I, I bring attention to it just because I think it's a really interesting word choice. Um, swilled has this 
connections with liquid, okay? So it can mean like um, liquid, rinsing something, washing something. But you have this idea that like that every tree was swilled with green, almost like it's swimming in green. It's dripping with green. And somebody, you know, freshly painted, the whole scene is just vibrant with green, okay? So there's a lot of... Um, energy, beauty, um, yeah, a really intense scene of um, springtime energy and beauty going on here that then gets kind of dismissed um, by this word, not May, but rising June. Uh, so we can see there's a big switch um, a big switch, but going back to this idea of not, um, not four, but rising five, um, the focus is that they're in May, you know, the month of May and the, the beauty that is May, but all of a sudden it's, the focus has skipped off May and is looking forward to June. And so what I have here is the, the, as this refrain, refrain pattern starts, we see the speaker's mood deepen and almost discount all the beauty by dis, that they've just described by pushing it aside with not may uh, and looks to the next phase. And then we got the same thing happening down here, not day, but rising night um, and this focus on the approaching darkness. Okay, so it goes from sort of dismissing energy and beauty to push on to the next thing. Um, and then this not day but rising night. And this is where the poem shifts definitely in mood. And things get a little quieter and darker. Okay, a little more serious. Um, and... The, I've highlighted this line, and in the sky, the dust dissected the tangential light um, that, to mark the shift, and and the quite different visually, too, with all these blocked lines and then these lines that are scattered. Now, I already mentioned to you that this image is <clears throat> tent tangential light is what um, maybe from math class you understand what a tangent is um, so a line coming off but when we talk about tangential light it's when the the sun is lower in the sky and it's coming across at an angle um, that you know at a low angle and that's like in the morning and in the evening when you get um, tangential light like that you you will have light kind of cut across a room or cut across a space. They're outdoors, of course. And that all of a sudden it lights up kind of things that are in the air that when the sun was more, you know, was more overhead, you didn't see. Okay. And, and that's the, that's the image she's creating here. And I'm, so I've got that clearly said here the mood clearly shifts and darkens with the lowering of the sun so literally the the light is diminishing on the scene but like figuratively too the the author's mood is turning a little more serious a little bit darker thoughts are this is a kind of um uh foreshadow but a build up to this how it's going to end you know pondering the idea of death um and so you can even think symbolically about you know day being life and night being death um but like kind of like the end the darkness that comes and um this image here of the tangential light um is the you all of a sudden, okay, this these things that are floating in the air uh, or suspended in air are suddenly visible, and I, so I'm I have wondered if if it me if he's trying to use this image to reflect like a sudden realization 
Um, and I I have here, day will soon be gone. What comes after light, dark, okay, what comes after, you know, kind of like at the end of our existence, death. Now, obviously, this is the first time this person has thought about death. But um, it could be a sudden recognition uh, about this perspective, about, um, you know, not May, but rising June, not day, but rising night, not now, but rising soon. Um, and this, this idea, this is, this not now, but rising soon is where he clearly, um, links this idea of, like, if there's a, you know, if there's a message or a moral, you know, kind of coming through from the poet, it's like the idea of, not living in the present and ignoring what's happening in the now and focusing on the what's you know what's next on the horizon um and possibly there's a message in this poem to uh enjoy the beauty and the the phase that you're in it, you know enjoy the moment be in the moment and let the next thing come when it comes instead of ignoring the now because you're looking at the soon, okay? Um, and so it's really clearly um, expressed here. Uh, but there's the idea, too, that we're, we're possibly missing the now because we're so focused on what's coming soon. And but there, there's also a recognition here too that uh, what what comes in the end is is death. Um, if we're always rushing to the next thing, rushing to the next thing um, in our life experience, um, then we in the end are rushing toward uh, toward death. And so it's quite a sober. Um, message that's coming through and especially in the final stanza but it could be the beginning of that um, thought that like realization uh, that he's trying to capture with this image of all of a sudden this dust being visible now you could also even take it a little step further and think about um, the reality that when we die, we, you know, ash, ashes to ashes, dust to dust kind of thing, that when, when, we, when our physical bodies die, they uh, decompose and uh, return to dust. And could that dust in the air be a trigger about thinking about death as well? I mean, that's, that's maybe a little bit dark, but, um, or maybe a little bit stretching, but it's certainly uh, an idea that comes to my mind in interpreting this poem. All right, uh, let's keep it moving here. Okay, so last stanza. Uh, we have, the, this becomes a lot more philosophical, okay? Um, and we... There's a, there's a big idea coming through that I think he's trying to um, express, excuse me, with both of these images here at the beginning. He's got this image first off of new buds push the old leaves from the bough, okay? Kind of the old out with, out with the old and on with the new, push aside, uh, make way for the, the next thing that's coming, okay? Uh, Get that out of here. I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating the next thing. Okay. And then the next image is we drop our youth behind us like a boy throwing away his toffee wrappers. Um, and this, I think the images are both trying to um, represent the same idea. Okay. The simile about... Uh, dropping our youth behind us like a boy throwing away his toffee wrappers. I've got up here in the corner, it, it, first off, it's a simile, um, because it's comparing um, people kind of 
chucking away their <laughs> their youth, uh, their younger age even, okay, but the time of time of life when they're younger, although that's probably true every day that you were younger yesterday than you, than you are today. But um, the way he talks about it, language choices that he uses um, shows this idea of devaluing uh, with the words drop, throwing away, um, and then comparison, comparison is to like this mindless tossing of rubbish over our shoulder kind of thing. Like you would, I mean, hopefully you wouldn't litter, but maybe this boy uh, is doing that. He's got these toffee wrappers and he's just kind of chucking them to the side, um, not even thinking twice. But the idea here is that the the wrapper that a toffee candy comes in is not of value to you. I mean, you pull it off the the candy and put the candy in your mouth and the wrapper is just trash. Um, and he's the poet is saying that we drop our youth behind us like as if it were something worthless. Okay, remember that in the stanza right before this picture of this, you know, sort of valuable, beautiful, energetic season of spring that we would link symbolically to um, childhood and youth. Uh, he's saying here in this stanza, like the idea that it has been devalued um and so it, you get that idea like that it's just um that the, the sort of human viewpoint that he's observing or maybe seeing in himself is a devaluing of of what's going on right now in favor of what is to come and um you know seen that as kind of sad, I think, um, that instead of enjoying the beauty and enjoying the moment, uh, that it's being pushed aside or tossed over a shoulder like it's, like it's worthless, okay? Um, we see the use of we for the first time in this stanza three. In stanza one, you saw pronouns used he, me, him, because there's a lot of focus on the little boy. Um, but here, it's a shift to we, and um, all of a sudden, I think there's this um, ownership, a recognition from the poet that this, what seemed like a childish phenomena or a childish perspective that was coming out of this little boy's mouth at the beginning of the poem, all of a sudden there's some recognition that, oh, maybe it's more than just kids uh, have this perspective. Maybe I have this perspective. Maybe I do the same thing. Maybe I am pushing away, devaluing where I am right now, the moment I'm in right now, uh, the way things are right now, and not, see, not seeing the beauty, not seeing the value, not enjoying, and instead looking past it and looking uh, to the next thing and missing the beauty and the value and the energy of the now, okay? Um, I told you this got philosophical. <laughs> um, and then we enter into this cycle of um, imagery and symbolism that I've got all highlighted in this kind of light blue color. And what I've done is he's got a series of flower fruit rot and baby cradle marriage bed grave. Okay, so the, the parts of the natural seasonal uh, cycle of the fruit, okay? You first have a flower on an apple tree, then you get an apple, and then the apple you know, grows to a mature apple, and then it might drop off the tree, and if it sits on the ground too long, it, it will rot, okay? Um, that's a cycle, then, you know, the seed goes into the ground, plants in a tree. <laughs> it's the circle of life, kids. Okay, but then he also goes through the same cycle here, where we've got a baby's cradle, a marriage bed, and a grave, all kind of like resting places, if you will, um, that that line up with these stage-wise. And what they represent, 
the flower and the baby cradle is youth. Uh, fruit and marriage bed would represent adult, uh, adult season of life. And then rot and grave would connect with, you know, elderly, aging, and death. Okay. And so you've got this uh, cycle in nature compared to the progression of human life stages, and that it all pushes toward the end, which is uh, death. Okay, that's how he ends the poem, not living but rising dead. Okay? We push, 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 hurry, hurry, hurry to the next stage, and at the end, oh, it's death that's there at the end. Uh, so it begs the question, why are we in such a big hurry to get there? Okay, so um, the other thing that we see him using here is the word never twice and the word only twice. Um, and these are examples of absolute language, right? When you say never, always, only, um, those are absolutes, okay? And so especially using them twice like that, um, we never this, only this. We never this, only this. Okay? He's making some big blanket statements about human condition and making these observations quite emphatic um, by using the absolutes. Okay? It, they're really strong statements that he's saying, we, and he's talking about humans. We do this. I see us do this. I see me do this. Okay? By using we, he includes himself. Okay? This final refrain, um, I think, is pretty powerful. It's sober. Okay? It's, it doesn't leave you feeling um, like with a big sloppy grin on your face or anything at the end of this poem. But... He's, um, at the end of the poem, he says, uh, not living, but rising dead. Uh, there's definitely a sober or dark tone created, um, but it, it's, a, it's a reality that we can't ignore, uh, that at the end of our life, uh, we will die. We are mortal. Um, and it, it kind of stops you short to think about, if everybody's in a big hurry to get to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, and then the last next thing is death, what, why, why are we rushing toward it? Okay, um, and it really helps you consider, I think, that um, the now is what's worth holding on to and enjoying, um, and perhaps we're not living if we live in a preoccupied way. Um, that's literally uh, taking our youth and our life. Like if if we're always not looking at where we're at and we're not enjoying where we're at, we're simply um, preoccupied with what's next or preoccupied with what is going to happen next or what we got to do next or we're too anxious, we're just sort of, you know, biding our time you know, looking for the next thing. Um, and that's what he's saying with the, we don't sit and enjoy the flower. We're always, we think about oh, how many, how many, how much fruit are we going to get out of this tree this year? And then when the fruit comes, we're worried about it, you know, using it up or it rotting or going to waste or whatever. Okay. Um, it's a little bit um, exaggerated maybe to say then in his next one that, um, you know, we look for the marriage bed in the baby cradle. We look for the grave in the bed. The, by bed, he's referring back to the marriage bed. Um, it's maybe a little bit exaggerated to say that we are already thinking about adult life uh, when, we're, when we're babies. But we do have that tendency to either be preoccupied or um, anxious about what's coming next and I think the big message that the poets uh, are trying to communicate is that we miss out on a lot of our living uh, that we could be doing by by not enjoying the moment and just soaking up the now right so that's 
that's his message, okay? What are we rushing through every stage for? Um, we're just rushing toward death, and that's not living, okay? I think he's got an argument here that to live means to enjoy the stage, enjoy the beauty, enjoy the energy of the now, okay? Um, last slide that I have here is on some themes that I think are touched on. Um, you got the idea of innocence and experience. Here the childish viewpoint is held up and explored, but it's followed by a realization that experienced adults are seeing life in the same way. Usually you see a contrast between the sort of innocent, naive viewpoint of a child and the wise uh, viewpoint of the experienced adult. But here we have the really interesting um, exploration that perhaps a childish viewpoint is still being held uh, by the adult in the, in the poem and he's questioning it, okay? Um, next is childhood and youth is shown as a season of energy and beauty, something to be enjoyed, cherished. There's definitely the theme of mortality in this poem, that our, the fact that we are mortal, that we will die, is a reality. But I think the um, poem is saying it's nothing to rush toward. Um, makes us question why we're in such a hurry to get to the next thing, and that, that perhaps that's not the best version of living. Okay? To live your life, uh, might mean more enjoyment, more focus on uh, the moment and the now and the, the stage that you're currently in. Um, and then time is definitely a theme that is explored here. Um, possibly communicating that it's meant to be enjoyed and not rushed along. The time is valuable and time is finite, okay? We, our time is valuable. Uh, each stage, each day, each year is valuable. And part of the why it's valuable is because it's limited. Um, we don't have endless days. Um, and so the title, Rising Five, also... Uh, kind of links in with that idea too. Rising has the idea of expanding while five is finite because it's a number word. It's limited. Um, that sometimes we f uh, feel like we have all the time in the world, but in reality our days are numbered. We don't know the number to our days, but uh, our days are numbered. And... Um, that's in the poet seem, seems to be a message from the poet it's like that that's a really good reason to enjoy each day instead of you know kind of hurrying through them um and ignoring what's going on in the now because you're so uh, anxious or preoccupied about the future okay that's it for the notes for rising five